Yeah, they're spectacular. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's called the City of the Gandharvas in the Vedas. Okay. Oh. When the clouds along the horizon are silhouetted by the rising or setting sun. And it looks like a city. You uh -huh. know, I mean, it, it seems like there are buildings and there are little people moving around and all kinds of stuff, you know. And uh, so this is, this is a, a poetic device used in Vedas to talk about illusion. Because, you know, like the rope and the snake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So instead of the rope and the snake, it's the city of the Gandharvas, because it's a well-known thing in Indian culture. Oh, okay. okay. Hmm. And wow. just like the rope and the snake, the city exists only in the uh, mistaken mind of the observer. Yes, that's the critical point. It's like a mirage. It's, it's a real mirage, mm -hmm. but it's only a mirage. And the thing that it apparently represents doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. So it, it exists and doesn't exist. You know, it, it doesn't exist as a reality, but it does exist as a perception. Right. Yeah. Like a, like a dream. Yeah. But the example is given of dreaming of being chased by a tiger. Uh -huh. Right. And you, you wake up and your body has all the symptoms of fear. <clears throat> mm -hmm. It's real fear. Mm -hmm. caused by an unreal perception. Mm -hmm. So yeah. similarly, we have so many experiences like this huh, that are basically just dreams or software, you know, uh, mm -hmm. significance or labels, uh, verbal constructions that actually affect us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you are now promoted to the head of the uh, quality control division of XYZ Corporation. Oh, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> and the well, next day, and you're fired. Yeah. <laughs> Even the bad news. Mm -hmm. All of those are simply designations. They only yeah. exist in the form of words. In fact, the whole idea of a corporation is nothing but words. It's just some agreements, some contracts, and like that. So, you know, does it exist or does it not exist? You can't really say. And this is why the Buddha refused to answer binary questions like that. Does the Tathagata exist after death or not? Not a valid question. Right. I mean, uh, Swami, what's, yeah. what, may I ask what the Tathagata, is that this, I don't really know what that is. I'd be guessing. That's a, a word for a Buddha. <laughs> okay. It means the well-gone one. Gata means gone. And Tata means that. Huh? Which is a code word in the Upanishads for Brahman. So he has gone to Brahman, Tathagata. Claro? So uh, his name uh, ties to the mantra Gate Gate, Parasam Gate. Parasamgate, yes. Parasam Gate, Bodhisvaha. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know, I, once I found out what that means, I just love that mantra. And oh, yeah. for William, what it means is gone, gone, gone beyond. 
gone beyond 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 it's the gone beyond beyond is where it really is at so certainly for a chant it points you in the right direction and i feel it's kind of aspirational yeah mm -hmm. yeah i want to be gone man that's right. <laughs> we, we used to say that back in the 50s and early 60s, the jazz crowd all studied Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And so they used to say stuff like, uh, yeah, man, that's gone, man. That's, you know, that's out of here. That blows me away, right? right? Blown away is another phrase that comes from Buddhist teaching. And uh, dig, dig it, man, dig, huh? Dig, man. The dig Nikaya, the dig Nikaya means the basket of the long sutras. Hmm. Hmm. So if there's something that you really dig, you want to hang out with it for a long time, huh? Like dig, okay. man. See all, all this old and cool. Nibbana, and there's a famous verse uh, from the uh, Udana, where the Buddha says, I have become cool. <laughs> Who ever thought the Buddha was so cool, right? <laughs> he was really, he was the coolest man. <laughs> cool cat. <laughs> now, here, here's a word you don't hear very, very much, and it's, it has great potential. And that is to grok something. Oh, Remember sure. that? Stranger oh, in a course. strange land. Stranger in a strange land. But you, you can know, use it, no. it may have more qualities uh, that we could use now nowadays. I never used it, but I had heard it. And every once in a while, I'll see some old thing and somebody will, or some, somebody my age will use that word. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was a, a common usage back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really grok that, you know. Uh. <laughs> Which means it, it really means to uh, come to a nonverbal understanding of something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Intuitive mm -hmm. understanding. Oh, I can relate to that. <laughs> like, oh, I get it now. Oh, yeah. So you grokked it, okay. That's what enlightenment is. It's yeah, an intuitive not, understanding of reality. Huh? Here comes Nicholas. Hey, Nick. Hello, Nicholas. Namaste, Nick. Can't hear you. Namaste. <laughs> He's muted. Yes. <laughs> namaste, Richard. Namaste, Ali Shakti. Namaste, William. Namaste. Now we can hear you. Yes, forgot about that uh, tricky bun right there. <laughs> okay. Namaste, Evelyn. Also, I see you in here. Yep. 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 Well, good. We have a good little meeting going here. Mm hmm. And here comes Kumar. Oh boy, all the regulars. <laughs> yes. Now I forgot, Nicholas, where are you located? How should we mute now? I'm from Philadelphia. Okay. Mm -hmm. Should we mute now, or, or is, are we still having a conversation? I don't know. It's like I seen uh, Nicholas <laughs> muted, and I was like, "Should I mute?" <laughs> <laughs> and Kumar is saying he's having problems with his camera, so we're just having the still photo.
I wanted to say I enjoyed your video. I started to, and I got sidetracked. Uh, when you were showing the mountain behind you, I, I, it was, uh, I think it was about sexual energy. And uh, there was peacocks going off. And it was just it just sounded like uh, you're, you said you're next to a lake and stuff. I was like, wow, it sounds beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And it, you had your, not your mountain, but the mountain. Well, maybe it's your mountain. <laughs> Who am I to say? <laughs> I'm taking it with me. <laughs> No, yeah, well, you can internalize it, and then it becomes yours. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I lived also by Era Natural for a number of years, and I could leave once I found out that uh, this mountain and the energy that it has is within me. So that once I found that, then it didn't matter where I put my body. It's there. It's like you have to go through a certain kind of apprenticeship that's very supple. And it, it takes most people a few years, um, you know, if, uh, if they get it at all. Um, and then it changes you. And that change stays with you, even yes. if you leave. You know, I used to get so much feeling of separation when I left Arunach. But this last trip, none at all. Mm -hmm. It's like he's with me everywhere I go. Well, I, I have only been there once. Uh, and that was about 25 years ago. But when, you're, when your uh, son says, Mom, you're really different, that's quite a feel of approval. Wow. Yes, yes. Mom, you really changed. And I said, I, I have? <laughs> he said, yeah, you have really changed. And that, and that was um, really very meaningful to me. Like, okay, it does work. <laughs> yeah. I don't see how anybody could not would not change from just just being there um, <laughs> if you're at, at all unless you're just trying to look at uh, you know the tourist attractions that well there are people that go through there and go gee is there anything to see around here <laughs> <laughs> or, or, uh, there are young people who go and uh, what they're trying to do is hook up with other young people who are traveling there. Yeah. Yeah. That's oh, of a there's a whole, whole big drug scene there now. Right. Or at least there was until, oh yeah, until the uh, pandemic hit. Wow. People coming, especially from Europe, yeah, and uh, certain guest houses uh, were, uh, you know, facilitating distribution and like that. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear so, that. <laughs> well, you know, if there's demand, there's going to be supply. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like any market. Our, our market, our demand is for enlightenment. <laughs> so universe is supplying. Yes. Now, I think uh, this is our group today, Swamiji. So uh, perhaps we should start and hear what you have to say to us today. Oh, I have a little talk all lined up. <laughs> I thought you might. <laughs> and I was looking forward to it. Oh. Well, we started on the Lankavatar Sutra. And Lankavatar is a wonderful sutra because it describes non duality uh, from a fresh viewpoint. And it is one of, if not the most important sutras of the Zen school, Chan Buddhism. 
So, uh, you know, the Sanskrit word dhyan, which means meditation, becomes chan in, in Chinese and zen in Japanese. So they're all about the same thing. And that is a meditation on the nature of reality. So I have a little list here. Oh, who else is joining? Kalisa. Ah. I'll wait till she gets set up. Swamiji, can I ask something real quick? Huh? Oh, this, never mind. Namaste, Kalisa. Namaste. Hey, just to join friends. <laughs> Who is asking? Oh, William. Go ahead. It's okay. Never mind now. <laughs> okay. Let me get my little cheat Sorry sheet about that. here. Okay. So, uh, Lankavatar Sutra is really about the world view of Zen. And so uh, the world view of Zen is very similar to the world view of Advaita as taught by Ramana and Shankaracharya and others, other great teachers. So I have to put on my glasses to read this. Uh, ah. Okay. So what is the world according to Zen? Well, first of all, it's non-dual. Non-dual means not two. Advaita. So we call it non-dual instead of oneness. Because if you have oneness, then you could have oneness plus oneness equals twoness. As, as soon as you start keeping score, that creates the possibility of multiplicity, duality, and more. So we call it non-dual, non-duality, advaita. And then the world is actually silent. Why is that? Because Sound is a vibration. It's an, it's an alternation between compression and rarefaction of a, of a medium. So because there's no vibration, actually, the actual world is silent. Because it's silent, it's nameless. There's no name, no names of anything. So even though in conventional thinking and ordinary consciousness, we give names to many different forms, uh, those are all imaginary. In and of themselves, they have no names. Even God has no name or quality. And uh, the reason for that is that the world is actually inexplicable. It cannot be explained by words. And this is called ineffable or ineffability. It's inexplicable uh, because, well, I'm run down a whole list of things here. It's dimensionless. There's no way to measure it. It's immeasurable. And it's also boundaryless. And, and because of that, 
there's no way to separate one thing from another thing. Any boundaries that we set are simply imaginary. And again, because it's silent, there's no vibration, means there's no time. Because we measure time by the, the swing back and forth between the extremes of vibrations. So because of this, the world is changeless. If it's timeless, there's no time to have a change. Change requires time. It also requires dimensions and measurement. See, but actually the world is immeasurable, dimensionless, boundaryless. There's no difference between this and that. And therefore it's changeless. So this leads to the Advaitans, both the Advaitans and the Zen people call the world unborn, ajatta. Because it's unborn, it's also undying. Now, what does that mean? It means that the world is not a thing in itself. Rather, it is an epiphenomenon of consciousness. An epiphenomenon is something that's not real. Like we were talking about earlier, uh, a mirage or an illusion, a dream. So therefore, it's uh, non-verbal, non-conceptual, beyond reason. And very importantly, it's impersonal. Oops. There's no persons there. Because the I, the ego, the individual identity is another one of these dreamlike epiphenomena that we create in the mind. And the Buddha has explained all this in the Mula Pariyaya Sutta how the mind creates the idea of I without there being such a thing. And basically what it does is it projects the concept of mind on the objects of the world. The objects are imaginary. The idea of mind is imaginary, but you know, mind doesn't care about that. <laughs> mind just says, oh look, this thing and that thing and all these other things are mine. So I must exist. See, if all this is mine, then I must be real. I must be a person. And I possess all these things. But this is all illusion. This is all concoction. This is all imagination. So because of this, the world is impersonal. It's like a dream. In a dream, there are apparently different people, but the whole thing is happening in your mind. So they're actually all reflections of you. The same thing is true of the world in general. It's like a dream. So it's impersonal non-individual, and it's also non-general. Just because we happen to see a pattern nearby in our environment, then we start to speculate that this is something universal. And the scientists are very uh, happy to discover all these laws, as they call them, and then assume that they apply everywhere and all the time. But actually, of course, there's no evidence for that. We can't go, you know, halfway across the galaxy and measure whether something is working the same as it does here. In any case, searching for these patterns is futile. 
because the pattern itself is something projected on the reality. And for every time that we uh, successfully can do that, there are many times that we can't. And we all have experience of this, trying to uh, project a pattern on the world and predict its behavior and failing to predict. But in those cases, what happens is the mind simply jumps to the next thought. If we observe ourselves carefully, we'll see how this goes on. So the mind never admits to being wrong, say. <laughs> unless you observe it very carefully, catch it in the act. So the world exists only in the mind, the patterns, the boundaries, the changes, the movements, the qualities, the objects, and so on. And so because of this, the world is actually effortless. It's effortless. Without any striving without any doing without any work because there's no doer there's no ego there's no uh, self with a small s empirical self so all of these things mean um that the world actually arises from and exists within the mind. See, in ordinary thought, we have this completely backwards. We think, well, there's a world, and in this world, there's this body, and in this body, there's this mind, and in this mind, there's consciousness, and in this consciousness, there's a self. But no. It's actually completely the other way around. There's the self, Brahma, the universal self, which has a universal mind. Then that mind is reflected in so many different bodies. Like the moon is reflected in puddles after a rain. And because of this, then the objects that apparently exist in the world arise in the consciousness due to the, the differentiations, the boundaries that we create, that we speculate into existence, that we imagine. And so it's said that the world is illusory, maya, that which does not really exist. So the world is actually unborn or uncreated. It's egoless, without a soul, uh, because a soul is an imaginary thing, uh, an identity, individual identity that's permanent. And there ain't no such animal. So identity, just like everything else in the world, is always apparently changing impermanent. So that means it's not really the self. That the self is without change, without activity, without even consciousness, because consciousness means awareness of an object. And there are no objects. <laughs> so the world is only perpetuated by habit. We pick up these mental habits early in life, and we use them to perpetuate the apparency of the world. And because of this, the world seems to exist, and like I said, uh, we seem to exist within the world and so on, but actually none of it is true. It's all like a dream, like the famous example of the rope and the snake. Person goes out at night, in the dim light, in the darkness, they see a rope, but they don't recognize it as a rope. They think it's a snake. Why is that? Because they have some memory 
or they have heard that snakes are dangerous and they hang around at night and stuff like that. So the world is the same way. The world arises because of our thinking, because of our imagination, and it persists because of our habits, which are things that we learned in the past, conditioning. And until we perform the sadhana to erase that conditioning, like I was talking about in the video today, to reformat your mind, like erase the whole disk, right? And <laughs> start all over again. Uh, then we cannot see the reality because the reality is hidden by all these imaginary things. So this is the process of self-realization. And it's done by meditation, dhyan, or chan, or zen, or in Pali, jhan. It's just all the same word, and it has the same meaning. So, you know, this is why I say, actually, the religions of the world, the different spiritual paths, are all ultimately one. None of them are invalid as far as they go. It's just that they normally, in most cases, don't go very far. <laughs> and the Buddha's teaching and teachings like Ramana's and Shankaracharya's are wonderful because they do go all the way, all the way to this uh, nonverbal, intuitive, inexplicable, indescribable enlightenment in which words are left far behind. And one comes to an intuitive awareness of the, the real nature of reality, which, as I said, is backwards from the conventional view. And I'm going to make some graphics and put this in a video uh, coming up this week. So um, that's that's my little show and tell for today. Um, so I'd like you like to hear from you if you have any questions or comments. Namaste, everyone. Um, I just want to share something I've uh, I've recently discovered this week in the video. Um, it's the uh, the Jane the Jane Jane Seven Value Logic. Ah. Um, in my uh, in my research and my discovery of you know enlightenment self realization, this was uh this took me to like another level in terms of what I could trust and what I could deem as you know real. You know, real being something like, uh, you know, anything that's that's real does not die, doesn't, you know, rot away. So with, with these seven viewpoints of, uh, of deterministic thinking, pretty much, um, it goes like things can be existent, non-existent, you know, it could be undetermined, and it could be existent and non-existent, you know, it's seven steps to the, uh, the seven valid logic. The point is, is that, uh, you know, that's the world. If everything is really a projection, and from me, from me, literally, it's in my head, then technically I couldn't be different. You know what I mean? And then that's kind of, it's kind of hard to explain, you know, given, given my, uh, you know, my viewpoint as of right now, but I really cannot trust anything. There's so many different views out there. You know, it's not just, uh, you know, absolute and not absolute. It's like a lot of things are unfounded. And when I apply that to my consciousness, I really, I really can see that I cannot trust my own mind. And people say also in a lot of teachings that your mind is something you could absolutely trust, you know? Like if I can deem this thing real, then it's real, but it's not. And that, that uh, seven value thinking, that logic, 
really goes to show why you should not trust anything. You know, it's not real because it's, it's not measurable. Um, even the mind is not measurable because you can't control it, right? Um, it just goes to show like, like the value of trying to see things for actually how they are, what they are, as opposed to giving your own, you know, your own commentary on it. So, um, yeah, I just compare that, that, that uh, seven value thinking to, uh, to death. Because I guess by definition, death is the only thing that we can actually experience. You know what I mean? It's the only thing that's uh, absolute. So I don't know what, what's, what goes on beyond. I thought I had an idea of it. I still can't even put my finger on it after learning about this today. I mean, uh, as of recently. Um, yep. That's all I wanted to share. Does everybody know what he's talking about? The seven valued chain logic system? No, I haven't heard yes. that before. We went over it in one video back in the days, <laughs> three or four years back, I think. Well, uh, the uh, ordinary Western logic uses what's called the dilemma. A lemma is a logical state. So the dilemma means the two states of logic, right and wrong, true and false, good and bad, up and down, in and out, right? inside, outside, like that. So all our Western logic is based on, this is called Aristotelian logic because Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, propagated it. However, the Buddha's logic is called the quadrilemma, meaning four logic states, true, false, both true and false, and neither true nor false. Hmm. That's the quadrilemma. And then the Jains had the septilemma, the seven logic states, true, false, true and false, neither true nor false, true but inconceivable, false but inconceivable, both true and false but inconceivable. So this is very interesting and because um, their uh, logic system is also open-ended, Uh, what is the name of it? I forget the name of it. Sanskrit name of it. But what, what the name means is that there is no one truth. There is no one way of looking at things that is absolutely true. So you can look at a thing one way and it's true. You can look at it another way and it's false. Another viewpoint would make it look both true and false. See, like the like the rope and snake. See, the perception of the rope as a snake is both true and false. Because it is a real perception, but it's a false perception. So it's both true and false, and, and so on. You can find so many examples in scripture. But you see, this expands now the possibilities of thinking into a whole new dimension. And, and this is what the Buddha did. Uh, he, and he said that ultimately everything is inconceivable. So the quadrilemma is enough. Ultimately, everything is inconceivable because the world itself is inconceivable. It's a projection. It's an illusion. It doesn't really exist. It's the snake. It appears real because we believe in it, basically. 
So, you know, we know from quantum mechanics, what you see depends on how you look. And the uncertainty principle, if you look for the, uh, the speed of a particle, you can't know its location. Or if you lo look for its location, you can't know its mass. Or if you look for its mass, you can't know its charge. You see? It's the Pauli exclusion principle. So, um, or the uncertainty principle, known by two different names. So this is true of reality in general. That we cannot really make a final determination of the reality of anything. Even death, I'm sorry to bust your bubble, but <laughs> Ramana says, death is just a thought. Yeah. It's an arbitrary boundary that we set in regards to the material body, the Anamaya Kosha. The Anamaya Kosha is only one sheet. And there are five. There's the Pranamaya Kosha, the Manamaya Kosha, the Vigyana Maya Kosha, and the Ananda Maya Kosha. But they don't die when the physical body dies. See? So even death is not an absolute. Birth and death, existence and non existence, truth and falsehood. Reality and unreality, you see, these are all extremes. And the Buddha always avoided any question that invoked these extremes. He would say, not a valid question. And when people would press him, he would say, well, we follow the middle. And of course, this, this middle path has become famous, but most people misunderstand it. They think it's like some kind of compromise between austerity and enjoyment. But what it really means is that there's a cause for everything. And the cause of ignorance, I mean, sorry, ignorance is the cause of desire, Shankara. Desire is the cause of consciousness. Consciousness is the cause of name and form. Name and form is the cause of the senses. The senses are the cause of contact. Contact is the cause of craving. Craving is the cause of clinging. Clinging is the cause of becoming. Becoming is the cause of birth. And birth is the cause of dwindling and death and suffering. This is Paticca Samupada. See, but then Zen goes a step further and says that even these causes and effects are duality and have to be transcended. That the actual reality is simply inexplicable. But on the spiritual path, there are different, different levels, see. So we're not expected to jump to the highest level right off the bat. But we come in in the state of duality consciousness, Dvaita Vada. And so there's different religious rules and regulations that we have to follow. And then in the next stage, Vishishta Dvaita Vada, we know that non-duality is the truth, but we can't realize it. So this is a stage of bhakti and love of God. Then the next stage is Vivartavada. And Vivartavada, we are actively seeking non duality. And this is the stage of meditation, dhyana. And then finally, when dhyana is mature, we reach realization, and that's ajatta. And ajatta means unborn. See, this is where the Vedic path and Buddhist path come together, right at the top that the world is unborn. It's inconceivable. It's not real, it's simply a projection, it's Maya. Uh, 
So all these tools have their place and they have the specific function and usefulness on the path. Um, I think the most important one though is jhana because jhana is what leads to realization. The thing is one has to be qualified for it. And one can attain those qualifications in this birth or maybe in a previous birth, in which case meditation comes very naturally. And uh, we see that, um, for example, in the cases of spontaneous enlightenment, where someone just sits down and within a relatively short time, they reach the end stage. Um, so in any case, the qualifications have to be there so that uh, dhyana or meditation can continue undisturbed and reach the final goal. Now, in our channel, in the beginning, we tried talking like from the top down, you know, uh, from the most exalted and highest truths. And we had a hard time reaching our audience with that. So in the middle part, uh, we went into the Dvaita Vada and the Vishishta Dvaita Vada, and we gave the teachings relating to the goddess and to karma yoga and like that. Um, the Kula path, Tantra, and all like that. So those are still part of duality, but they lead to the accumulation of good karma punya, which enables one then to have an undisturbed situation for meditation and to uh, actually immerse oneself in this non-verbal, non-conceptual view of the reality, which is not based on consciousness. See, and this is the thing you, you notice I get all excited when I talk about this because this is where I am right now. <laughs> I was just, I go to the beach every morning for about two hours and I, I walk and swim and maybe do some yoga stretches. And then I just sit down and meditate. And oh, it's nectar. It's just pure nectar. At any time, you know, in between when I have nothing going on, I'll just meditate on this nature of reality. And this uh, sutra that we're going through is helping to make it very, very clear what is the actual nature of reality. And so we're passing now beyond the verbal to the nonverbal truth, beyond logic, beyond understanding, even beyond consciousness. What more is there to say? But um, we talked about, Richard and I talked about some of the Zen stories and the koans and stuff that the Zen people developed. They developed an experiential approach. Right. We're using the philosophical approach because we don't have an ashram, a situation to use the experiential approach. But... Uh, you see, that the weakness of that approach is that it requires the presence of a master. Whereas the philosophical approach has the strength that even in the absence of a master, it can communicate at least the way, the path, the method. So we've been concentrating on that uh, due to the fact that really you know, I don't want to get involved in having an ashram and all this. And with the pandemic, it hasn't really been possible anyway. So um, I hear you laughing, Richard. What? Got a Zen story for us? I can't think of one at the moment. I am. Um... <laughs> Uh, full of Zen You're in story. Non, 
I'm full of verbal consciousness. <laughs> now I will uh, one of my favorite Zen stories, uh, and I'm not sure how this fits. It just comes to mind. Uh, two monks were uh, walking, and uh, they came to a muddy intersection in a road. And uh, there was a woman in a kimono uh, who couldn't get across the muddy road. And so one of the monks uh, picked her up and carried her across the road. And they continued their walk. And the other monk was just walking along, steaming, full of anger. And finally, when they got to their destination that night, uh, they talked about this. And the monk that was upset was saying, the rules of our order say that we're not supposed to have any contact with women. And here are you. You picked up that woman and you carried her across the muddy river. And... Uh, the other monk said, oh, are you still carrying that woman? I put her down on the other side of the road. Hmm. And, hmm. you know, part of what you is required is, uh, you know, we have to be willing to open up and let things go. And one hmm. of the troubles that we have is we're not always able to do that and when we don't do that then uh, th what we see in the world are the projections of all of these ideas about things that we're holding in our mind and uh, we miss the reality that is always there because of all of these projections. Incidentally, one of the requirements for stream entry is letting go of attachment to rules and regulations. Okay. <coughs> that, was, that was taught by the Buddha himself. Yes. The, the Zen stories are really wild, some of them. Like uh, two monks were discussing, <laughs> and one said, uh, does a cow possess Buddha nature? And the other monk said, moo. And then he put his shoe on his head and walked out the door. And if in case you don't know, in Japan, mu means neither yes nor no. Hey, so. Oh, okay, story. Huh? Nicholas said great story. I think it, it kind of like dragged out. I was trying to figure out what he said. I'm pretty sure. It's oh, yeah. Said. Yeah. It was a great story. Yeah, it, it I was like, it. did that robot thing. It was like, uh, uh. <laughs> I was like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, that, that Zen story that Richard was talking about, um, like the one monk carried the, uh, the woman across the, oh. uh, the muddy, you know, <laughs> surface. And the other one was still having her on, on his mind. It's kind of the same thing, you know? It... Mm -hmm. How do you mean that? So it's kind of like, uh, I guess they're both giving value to it. That's what I mean. Like uh, one was carrying her 
And then he mentioned, you're still talking about that? That's still on your mind? He was still technically carrying her as well? You know, it was, uh, it was given like, uh, I guess, like I said, they were both giving it value. So it was kind of like the same in the sense that, like it was the same object, basically. It was different action, but it was the same object. Mm -hmm. Sort of like uh, it was duality, if you will. Or maybe I'm interpreting this story completely wrong. Um, please well, the clarify. Point is, yeah, the point is not to be mentally attached. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, you can be, you can do something physically, but not do it mentally. Yes. You can have a, des you can have a desire, mm. you know, like, for example, uh, this body gets hungry two or three times a day. So you know, I go down and have dinner and feed it. But that doesn't mean I have a desire in my mind to feed okay. it. I simply take care, of the, take care of the body like an animal. Take it for walks, exercise it, <laughs> you know, hmm. really. And um, wash it when it needs to be cleaned, and so on. You know. So that does that means not to be attached to the body as the self. Similarly, not to be attached to, let's say, the rules of of being a monk for their own sake, but for the sake of enlightenment. And so they're, they're bendable. The rules are, are fluid. They're not cast in stone, as it were. You know, they're subject to situational interpretation. Oh, there's a beautiful story about this. There was one sannyasi living in the forest and he was very famous for always telling the truth. So one day he was at his hermitage in the forest and some travelers came and they said, there are robbers following us. If they catch us, they're gonna kill us and take all our stuff. Please help us. So the sannyasi said, okay, go, go and hide in the back. I'll take care of this. So the robbers came looking for the people and um, asked him, well, okay, did you see those people? Yes. Where did they go? Oh, they went that way. And the robbers said, we know you always tell the truth. So we'll follow your advice and go that way. Hmm. So then the people came out and they said, why did you, why did you break your word? Why did you break your vow? And he said, a vow is only to be honored when it's beneficial. Uh -huh. If it's not beneficial, then it can be broken without any problem. See, if he had told the truth, oh, they're hiding in the bank. <laughs> you know, they would have gotten killed or at least wrong. So by telling a lie, he, he broke his vow because it would be more beneficial to break it than to keep it. So that's the thing about rules, you know? Rules are only worth anything if they're beneficial. If they're not beneficial, you know? Uh, oh, there's another good one like that. There was one monk living in a hut on a, the property, on, on a widow's property. And the widow wanted to test him. He'd been staying there for some time. So she hired a prostitute to go to the monk and, uh, and say, oh, I'm really, you know, I need a lover. I'm so lonely. Can't you help me? And like this. 
So the monk said, he was old, you know, and he said, oh, this, in this body, there is no more passion. There is no more desire. I can't help you. I can't do anything. So then she left and she told the woman, the owner, the next day, the, owner, the lady went out and, and when the monk went for Pindapata, she burned down the hut. And she said, he wasn't compassionate enough. He could have at least held her. Hmm. See, he could have at least spoken some sweet words and soothed her heart. He didn't have to be so cold. He was lacking in compassion. So that's why I burned down his heart. He can go find another place to stay. Say rules are only good as long as they're beneficial. If they lead to hurting people or alienating people, but what's the use, you know? So, um, yeah, like I said, the attachment to rules and regulations is one of the things you have to give up to attain stream entry. Swamiji. Oh? Uh, <clears throat> your st the story about uh, the monk carrying the woman, I had a different, uh, there was a different, there was a different uh, message, I guess, that uh, I, I received or heard, whatever. Not, not that it's much different, but uh, the, uh, what, what, uh, <laughs> the experience that, that I've been going through or not going through, I guess that's debatable, is uh, recognizing, well, it's, it's sort of new to me, well, it's new, whatever, I'll just say it, is the monk carrying the woman, you know, even though the other, okay, the one that put it down, the, the, not it, the, the lady, oh, well, same difference, but put the lady down. He, the other guy who was upset about it, you know, and, and the way I hear it is that, uh, or the way it's heard, is that uh, he's living in the past, you know, he's not present. He's still carrying the he the other monk put her down. He's done with it, and the other guy is like living in yesterday, or you know, he's still asleep mm -hmm. <laughs> in the moment. I guess I don't know how to say. It. That's that's how I heard it because from the personal experience that I've had recently. Yeah, I feel funny saying things, but the personal experience is uh, I, I realized that when I'm not here, and it was interesting, is there's this blackness that comes over when I'm thinking of anything other than now. It's, it's a, it's, it's, I, I never noticed before, but there was like this, I could see the, the lights go out, so to speak, you know, and I'm like thinking of tomorrow or yesterday and I'm not mm -hmm. here. It's like this blackness comes over over the eyes or whatever, and and the, it was very interesting to say, "Wow, you know, when that happened, I was like, I never noticed the difference between this. This is called upadi. Upadi means covering. When the thoughts and the words, especially, cover the present, mm. then our consciousness actually dims. We become less present." It's a fact. That's what I was hearing with that story, or that's, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> mm. I think um, the word story is really critical in this because we have a we carry a lot of stories around uh, in our head <laughs> yes for example let's say you had a nasty breakup 
of your love affair some time back, maybe even 10 years ago. And you're in the mall and guess who comes around the corner? Your, your ex. And suddenly all the story pops up in your head, your body reacts to it, you get heart palpitations just because of this story that's been activated and it's been sitting there for, it's never left. Um, when you can get to the point, I think with being with somebody or situation and the story's not there anymore, then, then you're in a, in a much more realistic relationship to that. You haven't added anything on. Uh, and it's interesting, you know, if you can watch your mind do that, uh, it's been exposed. <laughs> it's uh, uh, the the other if thing. You, I, if you, you just know. if you just add awareness to that, That's right. how can it go on? It's exactly right. It's been exposed. Yeah. Yeah. You you don't need to try to suppress it or stop it. Just look at it. Right. And it will dissipate by itself. You know? Yes. yes. Uh, unless you're getting something out of it. And you're still... Well, that's... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the payoff, you know. <laughs> you get to feel... Yeah, we have to know, watch out for that. Wounded and see what you did to me. And, and there's a big payoff in that, you know. But uh, Boo-hoo, boo-hoo. <laughs> yeah, but if you can let go of that story, if you can, if you're aware of you're doing that, now you've gotten down to another uh, level of, of get, getting it out of there. The but see, this thing. is exactly what I was talking about in the beginning, that the reality is nonverbal. Mm -hmm. And all these stories and all these terms and all this knowledge and stuff comes between us and reality. And then we yeah. wonder why we feel a cut off and alienated. Yeah. Another thing that has been helpful to me, I'll mention quickly because I don't want to take too much time. You know those funny little drawings that's either the vase or the woman's face, mm -hmm. depending on... Huh? Are you Shire? familiar with... The that's Warshire very test, right? very famous one. Sorry. You, 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 it's clearly the mind that sees either the, the, the vase... Or the mind suddenly doesn't see the vase, it sees the woman's face. Well, that's a completely arbitrary uh, decision on the mind. The mind is doing that. Like the city of the Gandharvas. Yeah, that's what I started thinking when you are talking about that. When I, I had spent some time in <clears throat> Guatemala when the whole Batman craze started. And I, so I missed all that. And when I came back to the state, there were all these things in the supermarket I thought, what is that? It looks like gold teeth or something in the background. I couldn't <laughs> see it because I, I had no context. No one had told me about all that, what it is that I should be seeing. Finally, somebody pointed it out. I went, oh, now I, now I see that. It's but a that, bat. Again, it's a bat. <laughs> <laughs> I see that because I didn't have any history of being in the culture that told me what I was supposed to see. That was a, a good lesson. You know? <laughs> it's like when we look at the clouds and we see, oh, this one looks like a horse. Yeah. This one looks like a rabbit. You know? <laughs> Pure projection, right? Mm -hmm. well, Actually, it's just a cloud. For uh, many of us, uh, where we live is in the projections, and mm -hmm. it is what our mind projects to the world is what we see. And uh, for me, a big component of spiritual practice is to somehow get beneath those projections and I can't do it as long as I'm in a kind of mental cognitive state. One of the things that is wonderful about meditation is that uh, to start with, 
it happens in the present moment. So it's not filled with memories or desires or fears. And then uh, as the mind quiets, the projections also quiet and you get a chance to be in uh, what is real and what is always there. And uh, that brings great peace. I'm afraid we're uh, running out of time. And again. I, <laughs> yes, <started>. again. <laughs> it's just a concept, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. That's just a concept, but uh, the role that I've assigned myself is concept keeper. <laughs> <laughs> And before we close, William, can I make a suggestion sure. that you get some kind of a fill light to illuminate your face? Oh, okay. Because the way it looks to us, is your face is just <laughs> a, a blank. We can't yes. see the expression on your face. So <laughs> you really need a light in front of you. Like I have a, a, a fill light here just for that purpose. I also have fill lights. It's part of what is required in this Zoom existence. Really? Mm -hmm. You yeah. don't have to do it right now, William. Relax. That's good. I'll let you, you know, see who I really easy. am. Okay. <laughs> is that different? A little. <laughs> A little better, yeah. Okay. But still. <laughs> <so dark. laughs> I'll next time, next time. Okay, anyway, uh, thank you very much, Swami G. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, namaste. Um, all tatsat.